I'm now going to introduce uh, Julie. Uh, so I'm going to be reading it. I don't want to mess up things. <laughs> so uh, Julie uh, Phillips-Brown is an interdisciplinary poet, visual artist, uh, literary critic, and editor. She's the author of the adjacent, um, adjacent Possible. I'm sure I'll know sooner <laughs> how to pronounce it. Uh, published by Green Writers Press in 2021. Um, I have the book right here, so check it out. It's awesome, great cover. Um, and she's the winner of the Hopper Poetry Prize and a recipient of the Freund Prize from Cornell University. Uh, her writing appears in Bord Borderlands, Columbia Poetry, Poetry Review, Kreb, uh, Orchard Review, Denver Quarterly Interim, Plum, The Rumpus, Twick and Chum Notes, Vesa Review, uh, Yamasi, and elsewhere. She lives in Lexington, Virginia, uh, where she teaches creative writing, literature, and audio art, and studio arts. Uh, you can find her at takutelpoesis.com. I'm going to post it in the link. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, let's let's go from here. Hi, Julie. <laughs> Hi, Hi Poes. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Poes, uh, for that introduction. Thanks for welcoming me. Um, thanks to um, the, the Friends of the Lehigh Libraries for, for having me for this event. I'm really excited. I'm also really jealous hearing, you know, that really rich array of events and opportunities and materials that you, <laughs> that you have. I think I'm going to get in the car and come up, <laughs> come see it. Um, <clears throat> so I thought what I would do today is uh, read mostly from um, from this book and then time permitting, I'll keep an eye on the clock and see if we have time for any more recent poems. Um, but yeah, as you said, this is the book. Um, and I just thought I would say a little bit about um, where it came from, um, how it originated. So I first began writing this uh, a long time ago um, in Ithaca <laughs> when, when we were there um, together actually. And uh, it was my originally my MFA thesis. And um, after I graduated Cornell, uh, I, I went on to pursue um, an academic position. And so I, I poured a lot of my energy into writing critical essays and, and things like that. And so I backburnered um, the poetry manuscript for a long time. Um, and then I came back to it uh, around 2018 and started to really <laughs> try to revise it and, and send it out. Um, and that's when it won uh, the Hopper Prize. So it's been through multiple rewritings and revisions um, to get to the stage that it's at now. Um, and I will say, <laughs> if people ask what it's about, um, the closest thing I could say is that it's about questions of emergence and relation um, and thinking about, you know, what is it that all of us have in common as human beings? And the answer that I arrived at in graduate school and that I think is even still true for me today um, is that we all share this condition of being opaque to ourselves and to one another. It's really ultimately impossible to know what the interior experience is like for someone else and even for ourselves, um, you know, we're a kind of other. Um, you know, Rambeau would say, je est un autre, right? I is an other. So we're other to ourselves. Um, but I think that it's also a question of, given that that's the condition that we all share, what do we do about it? Um, you know, and I think that poetry, language and art uh, in many ways are trying to serve as sort of that, that impossible bridge um, across the divide, you know, between individual subjectivities, um, individual people. And so the book is really thinking in philosophical and poetic terms uh, about how you do that. Um, so let's see. Um, it's arranged in five sections. Um, that, uh, the first one is called substrata. And then the next four sections, winter, spring, summer, and late summer progress sort of you know, by the seasons chronologically. Um, and the poem, what else should I say about it? It's really a book length poem. There aren't so much individual poems, but they, one poem, you know, sort of runs into one another. Um, many of them are what you might call open field poems. So they look like that on the page. 
which is to say that they take advantage of white space. Um, you can read them in a normative order from top to bottom, left to right, uh, or you can read them um, in other ways if that appeals to you too. So um, they're open. And the forms in the book, uh, even though it might not seem like a book that's in conventional form, um, the forms here are Japanese forms, haibun, um, which is a prose poem followed by a haiku. There are tanka, which follows a 57577 structure. Um, there's also renga, which is um, a collaborative poem where one poet will write 575 uh, and then the po another poet will respond in lines that are 77 and so on. They sort of roll back and forth. Um, all of these forms are hybrid. I've, ch I've changed them. They're not you know, sort of original or traditional, um, but they provide a kind of scaffolding at any rate for, um, for how the poems take place formally. So um, I thought <laughs> I would start with substrata. Um, substrata is the first poem in the book and it's what, um, what you might call an ars poetica. An ars poetica is a poem that um, says something about the poet's theory of poetry, um, or in this case, tries to suggest what the rest of the book will be about. It sets certain rules or expectations um, for the poems and tries to teach you a little bit about how to, how to receive the language in the book. Um, so this is substrata. Whole fields curved to the sway of if. Unwritten as it is, indeterminate, interminate. Without hints, without hue, white. Without I, without you, without. And yes to is, to does, yes to and, or alternatively to or. Yes to winter fruit and other nouns, to adjectival adverbial rongers, and these flurried noises, yes, voices scrattle in the white cacophony of if, fully luminous. Um, and I'll just say that that poem is quibbling with the idea of pronouns. Um, <laughs> I had a poetry professor once who advised us, if you ever want to know what's happening in a poem narratively in terms of the story, to follow the pronouns and to watch how they shift. Um, and so one of the sort of underlying tenets in this book is that, um, that pronouns are something that's, that sometimes can stand in the way of or in front of um, the, the person themselves. Um, and they're also, Sometimes pronouns are a way of elevating the human um, above, the, above other forms of life. And so you'll notice that some of these poems um, use the pronoun one um, instead of he, she, they, it. Um, it just uses one um, as a way of suggesting an equivalence among all living beings. So um, I'm going to start with the first section, which is winter. <laughs> Like I said, these were written in upstate New York and Ithaca, so of course they begin in winter. Um, so here's that first poem. Morning. The field curves toward the river, edges fringed with winter sedge. Wind grazes an undulation of white hills. Waves of grasses stand as antennae, cast wide the prescient crackle, the cold air blazes on. Freighters haze over backs of hills, horns sounding down through the valley. The hills course, wake with industry, moat and floss upon a dazzled iris, heron in the reeds. Jet streak streams, white rough across a canopy, of downed silt. Snowdraft slows in untraceable directions, blooms in pale opulence. On the banks, particulars accrete, make a white. Houses crowd the hills and pine brush. 
There is an exhaustion of stars and fire bright, leaves gray, cumuli gray, swollen solidly. Only a blackbird silhouette darts through it here, here, there, pricks an unsystematic filigree over the distance. An atmosphere vined thick with weather, banks laden with the white of it. Clouds hold their encodings, their cyclonic ignitions, techne undertow. Some ones fold wings to their bodies, their fluttered keels first to surface. They duck, alternate as they swim through or range over intermittent ice flats. They feather, edges of white moving among other whites, a precise pantomime, camouflage of everywhere else, squad of reedy faces, bright eyes seethe from the mud beds. A white river of animate particulars flocks as the abstract, intent toward that empirical real. Um, and I should say that these poems, uh, especially in this, in this section are written um, what, you make, what you might call en plein air, like the same way that you might paint outside. These are written outside from direct observation. Um, I, when I was in Ithaca, I lived on the banks uh, of an inlet and I spent a lot of time staring out at the water um, out at the mallards that were there and um, occasionally at the Cornell crew team that would roll by too. Some ones roll over the water now. Their arms make a line of herringbone angles. Each oar pierces the water, sweeps flustered mallards to either side. One sits astride the stern, calls to each of the others how to move their limbs their bodies, how breathe, how skim. This is how one moves a craft. Arms advance forward, backward, however, together. Twist topography, miscellany of rain. One other stands on the blotted riverbank. Light snow forms, hints at falling, sifts loosely among the stones and water edge. Across the sun glare, the side-swept surface spreading, one waves in passing. As the sun slides slant, it moves more slowly. Ones move more slowly. The river cuts deep into its bed. Oars given over, the keels bump at the dock. In the low hung branch spread, leaves curl inward, make a deckled umberwood. Ochre and violet have the run of the hills. Cloud passes cloud, opaquely, the whole of white drifts in gunmetal flight. Darkling, it makes a black, a crinkled slick, thicked over unmoving, no one is by the river. Lights twinkle from the window frames, houses all shut. One still looks out to see the movement that is not there, the quelled pitch that is. Each one lies asleep in its own life, dreams a lark, keen incongruence. The willow branches at the river edge lean toward daybreak, buds coiled within fur sheaths, tightly a furled pressure, corms, tubers bursting in earth, initiate an aeration, siphon, the atmospheric expanse ranging above. From no place, two ones, an emergence in the white, of the white, they cleave a blind parallel. Um, so those were all high bun that are sort of exploded or, or atmospheric. Um, and then the book switches to um, a series of pairs 
of Tonka. They look like this on the page. And they're sort of like this small typographic insignia, two brackets that are slightly off center to one another, um, which is my typographer's way of saying that there are two figures <laughs> that are in relation, but not quite true to one another. They're a little bit disjointed, a little bit off. Um, <clears throat> so here are these two figures doing what they do in tandem and yet separately. One scales arising back to the hills and climbing full height. The rocks cast rocks upon rocks. One angles against earth rise, flight skyward. One emerges a small vertical at the river edge. One watches waves as by the bank waking one to the river's wake one. One rifles over the prospect of scapular hills, scans a metered distance, breath an analogous cloud surface the mountain. One sounds the waters, breaks toward a bottom of a delimitation. Fathomless remains the river, remains one, each at the last. One turns the eye under cloud cover, an open pool, blue running onto blue, lapsed distances. One blinks at haze of ice, snowfall. One furls the tongue at the river edge, one cinctures the word and the real, cracked breath of language. One slips under wonders, seated dream. A cloud self. One flowers among the watery veils. Out palm, open. And I'll read just one tiny one from spring, <laughs> since we're in the midst of it. Um, and then I'll take us straight to straight to summer and late summer because that's how it works in Virginia. We don't really get a spring here. Um, okay. So this is um, this comes from one of the Renga sections, which is the back and forth collaborative poem um, in spring. What of that adjacent field, lovers synchronicities, cilia, uncharted swarm minds, each potent with the possible, how we want for it and why. We listen, intent toward the objective that fragile if. And this is from summer um, and it's back to the Tonka, the pairs of Tonka. And I will say that, um, that these sections are, the two figures in these sections come from sort of uh, mountain and river tradition of Chan poetry. So one figure um, is associated with mountain um, and the other um, with river. And you might hear that theme unfolding a little bit as we go. One lies on the mountain face, on earth run wet. A canopy of leaves bends earthward, branches cleave a field in two one scarcely. One tumbles with the rock face toward the river, indigo sky spattered bright. A softened plain, a single field entire, fled wet. One thunders faintly, the water recedes with the riverbed, nightfall. Flutters an eye, skin memory, the not possible, touch in an umber mind. One rushes where one lies still, cracks wide in a vibrant daze. Across a blackly blaze, one marks a joint of eye, 
the barest gaze. Um, and we're back to some of the, the renga, the back and forth poem. Uh, and this is the point in the book where um, the rules break. You know, the first poem tells you that we won't be using I, we won't be using you. Um, and these poems now violate that rule that we began with. Your dream of the present, worlds counted, each particular, precisely particular, all that is solid, shed. Let us be unspeakable, unemergent, unrealized, some possible un-in-fact. Phantom patterns cross an interior eye, recollected the self appeals to mere intuition, an insu insinuation of insight. Is it the inmost inner, darkest gridded glass by which we see? Does it show slanted the true? Or is it no gleam at all? The actual self burned across the atmosphere of its own external limits. An actuality in the gloam, an eye comes to iridescence, shatters unsaid innumerables, unaccountable infinite arches branching a blank sky. Light lowers unbound. We try the particulars. The possible leaps its blank dance, a distant arc we know by touch. The iridescence is here. It is latent, lambent. This unsteady dialogue convolves. We wait, each word halting on lip, tooth. We speak in tongues unfamiliar lose all insight, see. We speak, an open field wakes. The natural dissonance of relation arises, the way a body articulates in wordless exchange. And then the last section is late summer. Um, and I, I guess you could still call these um, tanka, but they are barely that. <laughs> um, and then the poem ends with probably, the book ends with probably the, the most traditionally lineated <laughs> stanza in the entire book. Um, okay, this is late summer. The field trembles with voices, floss, white noises carried on breeze, each voice echoes after its other, reticulates notches, touches down in air. The river wanders, the mountain wanders. Ones perturb a single field, its saturate media. Ones ring with turbulence as I slides over I, a glance joint. Leaves do curl closed against nightfall. The air sinks warmly over grasses by the river. Ones speckle the twilight, a glitter, a glitter craze. Has it always been an entire field, the same field? Have we always? Once did dally in a white light, blushed under the skin. One's trace an unfamiliar chitter of eye, shoulder. One's drift, lays in a subjunctive mode. One auto catalyzes, sparks with a charm and lights for its immediate other to see. Its other echoes and answer, lights, more others now, whole field of lights sways across river inlet, rises toward peaking mountains. A late cloud light tinks at the atomic. Fly fire.
And this is the last poem in the book, or the last section. Anyway. Imagine the beautifully adjacent as arms, as echoed hearts, the perturbed possible that fires the skin, pierces the eyes. The palm at the end of each mind, that which delimits, blazes brightly and means because it is. That star-eyed if, as each of us forms with the question, will you be still by me, still possible? Um, and that is the end of the book. I'm looking at the time. Boaz, do you think that we have time for more poems or do you want to switch to questions? How about we go for a few more? A few more? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me just say that, <laughs> let me pick up some other poems here. Um, like I said, one of the major concerns of the book is the ways in which we are opaque, you know, to one another. Um, and recently that same problem has emerged again uh, in, in my life. Um, but this time it has to do uh, with my parent, um, one of my parents who is experiencing changes in mentation. And so the, you know, the relationship that um, that I once had has has changed fundamentally and continues to change over time and just sort of reinforces that, you know, even the people that we consider most beloved and intimate with ourselves are in some ways um, illegible and maybe um, unreachable too. And so uh, it's been, I'll be honest, it's been incredibly painful. Um, and, you know, poetry was a way to try to help me navigate um, the sense of ongoing loss that I experienced. And so I'll read a couple of poems about that, uh, I think. Let's see. Um, okay. Okay. Um, the first one's called Second Cut, and it's got an epigraph. It's for Mary Rufel. Let time run through whatever is not us, I thought. Us, the braided word I wanted. Our compact, a singular rock, untouched by tide. Our bank high against cut of current. Hours turn toward other horizons. But loss lives in every felt thing. I touch my own skin, its spectral flux, of vessels, fat, fascia, already elemental, trembled without purchase. Let this churn be a homing. Let this body hold the bodies it becomes. Another cut, everything breaks, everything goes. Um, and then I will read this is a prose poem. Um, <laughs> at least I think it's a prose poem. Just to say it doesn't have stanzas, it has paragraphs. You might call it flash fiction, but since I'm a poet, I'll call it a prose poem. Um, and it's called Breakers. Breakers. The first thing she emphasizes is the size of the surf that morning. And I guess it must have been early dawn because she has always been a morning person. And she was probably at Ove's beach stand, on the boardwalk, on the beach, in the shallows, when she saw the man drown. The man was young, handsome, his longboard tucked under one arm as he walked out, his girlfriend holding his other hand. It happened quickly, so I'll just tell you. Sets of breakers started coming in swiftly, one on top of another. The man and woman lost their footing. She was pulled under. He dove to save her. He pushed her slick body onto the board and then the dark swallowed him. She clung to the board while my teenaged mother ran to call the police. 
the woman lived. Years later, I observed that my mother always seems to be the hero of her own story. My brother shrugs, says, but that's what everyone does. No, I say, I'm a writer. There's always more than one way to tell the story. So let's see. My mother was young once, and when she was young, many things frightened her. When she had her first child, she grew more afraid. Her love lived inside a pillar of fear. The child grew and her fear grew. When the child was old enough to listen to her stories, she remembered the man she saw drowned. And these were the lessons she wanted to teach. The man should never have gone into the ocean that day. Hold the ocean in fear and awe. Never turn your back. Terrible things can, will happen. If a man does go into the ocean on a stormy day, his reasons should be sound. A man saves a woman. That is his purpose. A woman lives with her sorrow forever. We try to help anyway. Do your best. I am not the hero of this story. I am drowned with fear. I didn't know what to do. Sometimes a woman can't save a man. Um, and I think <laughs> those are not happy poems. <laughs> let, me, let me read one other poem that's related, but slightly more happy. I can find it. Sometimes I like to read this one. This one's uh, for my six and a half year old son, Aiden. Um, and I, I, when I published it, I asked him, I said, do you want to read the poem about you? And he said, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> so I share it with you instead. Um, and this poem's called Bop, Lunadia Heros. And what you need to know is that Lunadia Heros is the scientific name for um, the snail that inhabits this shell. Um, okay. Bop, Lunaria Heros. We begin with the umbilicus, the whirls between me and you, the curve of shell as the snail snakes around itself. Lunaria Heros, large as a child's palm. My foot found it first, tender arch cupped to cool dome, and I bent down, feeling for its edges until my fingers clutched, then wrenched muscles, tendons, bones, together. This heaven was nothing like I expected. It was at the bottom of the sea. Lunaria Heros, I held you, the moon in my palm, as I hold your child's face now, your eyes lucent as the first time you held your face too close to mine and thought to kiss your mama. I lost you, Lunaria Heros, the way most children do. We sold that house, all our belongings put away, and somewhere I must have left you. If I returned, then perhaps you would be there still, on the ledge, in summer haze, where I saw you last. This heaven was nothing like I expected. It was at the bottom of the sea. It may be you are my North Star, my sun, my northern moon snail shell. Here we are now, our eyes primordial mirrors to share the stolen light between us. But I still want her, Lunadia Heros, and my mother's song at dawn, the open window, father undone with laughter and brother burbling. I want to go back, my child's heart, I would give it to you, this heaven at the bottom of the sea. I think I'll close with that one. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. 
I, I always don't know how to go beyond that because the, the reading <laughs> of poetry is kind of always, you know, quite uh, experience on its own, right? Then the questions feel kind of a little less significant somehow, but here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Um, I was I was particularly uh, kind of drawn to the latest ones somehow just personally because of things that I've been going through, uh, you know, like with the, uh, our newborn and uh, also with the parents uh, and their condition at this point. And, you know, I, I was thinking about the kind of trajectory, like you said, that the, this book has uh, grown, like started from the Cornell experience and, and, and evolved and it took a long time uh, to get to, to publishing uh, it. And can you share somewhat, you know, like how does that work out, you know, like writing uh, on such an extended period of time and, you know, like how, how do you go about it? You know, things you have explored uh, those days uh, at Cornell with the water, um, looking at those uh, nice, uh, water um i remember that place it was so amazing and, and so what what happens you know with time when you're reading you know those poems and do you change them yeah um i mean it, you know it was a really i i had a fortunate thing happen which is that another poet um gabrielle calva caressi was offering manuscript consultations um if you uh donated um, to the crisis of the, uh, on the border, you know, during the last administration. Um, and I mean, I, I was going to do it anyway, um, but I thought what a gift, um, you know, that Gabby was offering. And Gabby took time to sit, she, you know, I, I asked, well, do you, how much of the manuscript do you want to see? And Gabby said, send the whole thing, uh, <laughs> which is just incredibly generous when you think about the amount of time that, um, that they put into reading it. Um, and responding. And so, um, you know, Gabby took about 30 minutes, uh, maybe longer with me talking, you know, after they had read, just talking with me um, about the book. And I came away with about 10 things um, that I wanted to try to retool from the original manuscript. And so I don't think it would be the same book without that conversation. Uh, and in many ways, uh, in the 10 plus years between writing the original draft and the subsequent revisions, I was definitely, you know, I became a different person. I became um, a wife, a professor, a mother, <laughs> um, you know, so the things that caught my attention were, were different, but in some ways, you know, I mean, Ezra Pound would say that, um, that any poet has only about eight different things that they say in their lives and then they just keep saying them. Um, and when I look at the more recent poems that I'm writing, I'm like, oh, it's, it's still about that, you know, opacity that we have, you know, uh, amongst ourselves. <laughs> it's just, um, they're a little bit, there, there is a first person narrative in the more recent poems. It's, it's more autobiographical, but um, the other thing that I, that I, that changed was that I had learned a lot about poetry. I had been teaching poetry for a long time as a professor by the time I came back to my own manuscript. So all of the things that I had been preaching <laughs> you know, for my students, I, I had to challenge myself to apply to my own manuscript. Um, and so I found myself in the position of being um, an editor and really also kind of a midwife to the, the 25 year old version of myself that had written the book. And I would see things in that original manuscript. And I would say, I would almost talk to that earlier self and say, Oh, I, I see what you're trying to do and you know you're not doing it well but let me let me help you you know <laughs> um so i think that that's how it felt by the time i was rewriting i had some of the chops like the um the tools and the craft to deliver that i, I maybe didn't have necessarily as a 25 year old before i sound too highfalutin i'll also say that i didn't have some of the um the flashes of insight and brilliance that I had as a 25 year old, those are gone. <laughs> so, so I'm relying on experience and craft at this point. So, um, but that's how it felt. It, it felt like being an editor to a, a, a version of a 
an earlier version of myself, you know, and, and being able to get back in touch with what I was trying to do and see it through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm going now to uh, Win Mayer's uh, question. And uh, if uh, you're uh, shy about a question, uh, adding another question, don't be. Please do add your questions. Uh, we have a few uh, more opportunities to ask Julie. Uh, questions about what she does. Uh, so Wynne uh, is asking, first question, <laughs> uh, can you say a bit more about your process of going from thoughts and observations to completed poems uh, and a collection of poetry? Uh, how many rounds of revision do you do? Uh, how do you decide when a poem is finished? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all really good questions. And I don't think they have necessarily easy answers. And I think the answers also differ not only poet to poet, but also project to project. Um, I'll say that this book is a little bit different in the sense that it was conceived as an entire like sort of book length poem. Um, and I sort of, I forgot for a while um, how to write just a single, you know, poem on the page. Um, and I had to reteach myself how to do that after I wrote this book. But um, yeah, uh, so going from thoughts and observations to completed poems. Um, I don't know how other people work, but I, I definitely, um, I, for me, like poetry is a very material process. And I think that comes from my training in the fine arts, in studio art, but I, I make very little difference in my mind and in my intent and attitude between drawing from observation, you know, draftsmanship and writing you know, sort of from observation. And they, and so they, they both always take place first as sort of a tactile and kinetic process of, of drawing or writing by hand. Um, there's, there's always a manuscript draft. Sometimes it's set right against sketches, you know. So some of these plein air poems have in their background, they, they have landscape drawings attached to them, right? Um, and in fact, there was a, an artist book version uh, of the adjacent possible that was meant originally to have uh, ink ink paintings um, alongside the palms and it just never I never collected the funds <laughs> I won an award for it and then never collected the funds to make the book such is life as a graduate student what a lost opportunity um, but anyhow so um, so it, it starts with that it starts with you know working from observation and then when I think about how to get that into a, a complete poem, boy, you know, there's two things that happen. It, it's still a tactile process where I feel like I'm pushing the words around um, on the page. A lot of these poems, most of my poems are when they make the transition from, um, from page to screen, they, they go into uh, InDesign actually, rather than Adobe InDesign, rather than, Microsoft Word, um, and that's because I'm trained as a graphic designer and a typographer, and I just really want to have the, you know, the leverage and flexibility that a graphic layout program provides um, that you can't necessarily get from Word. Although you can do amazing things with Word if you're, um, you know, if you're inventive enough. So, uh, and then it becomes about sound, you know, just reading, always reading the poems aloud and, and letting letting the, the fragments of language live in the body and see you know, how they you know, sort of play off one another, what sparks, what doesn't. Um, you know, I firmly believe that, that the, that the poem has to live as an extension of the body. So um, rounds of revision, many. Um, <laughs> I'll just say many, like at least three or four, right? And then, I, I don't have a good answer about deciding when it's finished either. Sometimes it's as simple as sending it out for publication. And if they take it, <laughs> <laughs> it's finished, finished. Um, I will say that writing a book was, um, composing a book was different. Every time I thought I was done, I wasn't. You know, there was another editor who had a round of suggestions or, you know, there was, it, it was, um, it's a feat of endurance, I realize now to, to make the final product that makes it to the shelf. So, you know, hats off to anybody <laughs> who mm -hmm. undertakes that. Okay. Um, 
to jump to another person, uh, Ilhan. Uh, Ilhan Shitak is asking, uh, can you tell us your opinion about poetry workshops, mm -hmm. uh, creative writing programs? Uh, as a professor, <laughs> there is a strong belief in other parts of the world that poetry cannot be taught actually. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like I, I can imagine, it's not just the teaching, it's also the kind of production that, uh, you know, like maybe needs to be genuine in a way that is not taught and you know like uh, that uh, genius type uh, of kind of thinking uh, so yeah tell us tell us what do you think about uh, yeah. shops and uh, do you have advice for us how to do them <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> well um yeah i think that's actually a really good question um one thing i'll say is that historically the MFA program in the United States is a relatively recent phenomena, as I understand it, sort of like 1970s onward. You know, so you're looking at the last 50 years, people have had MFAs, you know, from creative writing programs, but they didn't really exist before that. And yet somehow, you know, poetry, literature did all right for itself. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think that that's a fair observation. And it's, you know, and it's, it's not a solely American uh, enterprise, but it is a heavily American enterprise. And so I think that's important to note that right in, in other parts of the world, other cultures, literature, again, is doing fine for itself without, um, you know, sort of the programmatic support. But uh, what I what I will say, um, so Cornell's MFA program is a residential program. Um, and I really did benefit from my time there. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, there was something really valuable about working closely with poets that I admired, both as faculty and as my peers. Um, even just the idea of being taken seriously as a poet for the first time. I remember arriving on campus and Alice Fulton said something like, hello, poets. And I was like, who is she talking to? You know, <laughs> she's, she's talking to me, you know? And there was a lot of permission in that. Just the idea, just the ability to be able to think of myself as, you know, um, a serious or valuable writer in some way. Um, so just taking myself a little bit seriously, taking the work seriously um, was important. Um, and I, I guess I'm the type of person who needs that programmatic, you know, <laughs> blessing. Um, if you can muster that within yourself intrinsically, it's probably better. Um, but <laughs> there you have it. Um, and then, you know, but I will say that it's, it's true you know, coming out of the MFA program, I, I think I knew so much, you know, I only knew so much. I was probably 27 or 28. Um, and I had written a lot of poetry at that point. So I had produced a lot of work. I think that was a good, a good thing, you know, to, to get a sense of what, um, what my capacity was for poetry. And at the same time, I had a lot left to learn, uh, which I think I've, <laughs> hopefully I've acknowledged. And one thing that happened during the pandemic actually was, I joke about this, but I, I earned myself a, a second MFA. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that um, I was so terrified and just eaten up um, by the changes that were happening in the pandemic, the changes that were happening in my family that I started attending all kinds of poetry workshops, readings, events, craft talks, online on Zoom um, as a way of staying connected with people and having community. And I, th I think uh, it was something on the order of about 50 different workshops um, that I attended, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, I think, you know, but I, I think it indicates kind of where I was at mentally uh, in terms of my mental health, but, um, but it was a really, important mechanism for survival. And it's interesting, it's, it's a totally different experience to come back, um, you know, as a writer, uh, a more experienced writer in those workshops and to be with writers, you know, who don't consider themselves necessarily undergraduate or graduate students, but they are, you know, professionals who are returning later in life, you know, students who are coming back to poetry um, and who just, uh, had a real sense of energy and engagement and excitement about the work. And there was just so much to learn, you know, from everybody there. So I will say this, that, that the, I think the workshop is valuable. I think it's a valuable model, um, but it's definitely one that doesn't have to live within a creative writing program. 
it can be something that you pursue for the rest of your life. I now know that going forward, I'll, I'll continue to take poetry workshops, discrete ones, you know, here and there, um, anytime I'm in, in need of that community and that connection, so. Yeah, I, uh, I, when I go back to the MFA days, uh, I, I thought, you know, for me, it was a very valuable experience because of those uh, uh, critiques that happened uh, mm -hmm. every week or every two weeks or whatever. Uh, and even though, you know, like they were uh, sometimes quite painful, <laughs> in my case, I, <laughs> I really, I, I appreciated that attention. And I, and I thought that, uh, you know, like there, there was an effort to kind of uh, really see who you are, you know, beyond mm -hmm. even the artifacts, uh, and uh, and I think that this this is uh, kind of maybe in a workshop, uh, you know, it's not a two year program, it's a workshop, <laughs> so uh, maybe there is something about that uh, time uh, spent together with others that is uh, really effective, um, you know, in a, in that uh, setting uh, for me. Uh, but uh, but it's great that you see sense in it, you know, <laughs> like this is, uh, uh, there, there are lots of, um, you know, uh, ideas uh, about the, the value uh, of those. Um, th there was a, another question uh, by Wynne uh, about uh, poems to music. So mm -hmm. uh, the question, I'm gonna read it now. Uh, do you ever think about setting your poems to music uh, or uh, collaborating with a composer to do so? Uh, and if so, what kind of music would best represent the mood and themes of your poetry? <laughs> oh, heavens help me. I, um, <laughs> you know, let me... <laughs> <laughs> Let me first say that, yeah, I, I would definitely need to be collaborating with a composer. I, I don't have much of a musical bone in my body, and I, I can't say why. It's, it's, I'm very disappointed in myself. Um, and my musical taste is, I think, what my students would call basic, I think is the word. Um, you know, I grew up around Philadelphia, and I, I just love Motown, hip hop, Nine, like I recently got an MRI and they said, what kind of music do you want? And I just shamefacedly said, I, I would like some 90s R&B, please. Um, it's very different from my poetic aesthetic. Uh, I have tried um, to reconcile those two sort of parts of my psyche, my life. Um, you know, there's another part of my life where I, I'm going to go ahead and admit this. I spent many years in my youth at the roller skating rink, um, skating to old school hip hop <laughs> and doing what's called shuffle skating, which is where you skate in formation with other people, right? And you do synchronized moves to old school hip hop. Um, and I, I have not managed to make that a part of my poetic life. So I don't know how to make those two talk to each other. Um, and I don't know what a, I don't know what a composer would do um, with these, these poems, I'm sure that I would be surprised. You know, I would be delighted. But there are there are poets who have done this really successfully. One of the ones uh, that I admire the most is Susan Howe, and she works with the composer David Grubbs. And they have made, I think, a number of different CDs now that are available. And I'm not being paid to say this, but you know, <laughs> check them out. They're great. So, and thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Wayne. If if you have some idea ideas about composing, yeah, I'll <laughs> like, take them. <laughs> talk with talk with Julie. <laughs> uh, uh, so so kind of maybe last question I have and uh, uh, today uh, had to do with the topography and kind of you know like that interplay uh, with the um, space around the poems and all that. And I think I, I said that before uh, you started reading. Uh, uh, today, Julie, uh, that, you know, I was really curious about the way that you're going to be reading the, the poems, because, you know, when, when I read them, I kind of went, uh, kind of, I went right and left and down, and then mm -hmm. I was like, is that the word that I need to consider now, or is this, you know, like something that, uh, you know, like I can kind of put aside and, and kind of think more about it, 
uh, and uh, uh, as as an art piece on its own, because the way, it, like once you uh, uh, have a handle, uh, get a handle on the book, you'll see how, uh, const how it is constructed as an art piece, as a kind of holistic kind of uh, creation. And uh, uh, so I, I kind of wonder, and there are spaces in between words, Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and then there is the more formal structure that, uh, you know, like those three different ways to, to go, go about the poems. So can you say more about what are you, what, where is it, uh, in, what is the inspiration around this and, and what does it mean that we have, you know, all those different kind of <laughs> ways to uh, channel uh, our uh, intentionality, I guess, around the reading or the perception uh, of your poems uh, and uh, uh, what does it mean for you as a creator that you're creating things uh, that are mm -hmm. maybe can mean many different things to many different people, uh, which usually is the case, but maybe even more because now it's even in the visual medium and maybe musically and, and otherwise. Yeah, I, yeah. Not an easy one, but I, I had to ask. <laughs> no, that's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm interested in poems that, you know, do make themselves available on, you know, sort of multiple dimensions and to multiple perspectives. So like just, just in the same way that I'm not, that I'm working in these poems to try to maybe deprivilege um, the human perspective. I'm also interested in, in decentering um, a, a singular narrative or a singular perspective um, on the, wor the world, which is, in, you know, it's interesting. I was writing these poems in a place of sort of deep despair, which I think everyone experiences in Ithaca at one time or another. Um, and so in many ways, the, the poems were, were about just trying to get my bearings, like look around myself and say, okay, what is here? You know, breathe, <laughs> you know, what is here? What can I reliably, you know, connect with? Um, you know, but the, but interestingly, the more you try to sort of center yourself and, and embed yourself in that space, the more you realize how porous, you know, um, and tenuous and precarious in some ways the connections are. And there's, to me, there's ultimately kind of comfort in that. Um, you know, if you can, if I can get myself to a place where I'm really willing to sort of release the preciousness of the self or the singularity, um, you know, then you're just free, just freed a little bit, you know, from the, the burden of the ego and all the terror <laughs> you know, that comes with it. Um, so, you know, so I'd be very happy if somebody were to, to start these poems and read them, you know, starting with a different line, a different phrase. Um, it also comes from the idea that for, like for me, I really saw the page as a field and that the words could, you know, emerge from them. Um, and one of the things that, and so I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about it as, you know, foreground, middle ground, background too. There's a way to read these poems you know, not upright as a book, but sort of flat as a plane and to think about how the words sort of, you know, arise and have, I think, agency of them of their own too. Um, I really do believe that the language is its own animal and that, you know, the poet at best sometimes is just trying to sort of um, annotate, <laughs> you know, or sort of, you know, we're just sort of, you know, fancy stenographers trying to get things down, but the language is doing uh, what it wants for chasing it. Um, and so I think that, you know, maybe accounts for some of the, the visuality. And I think also, you know, the silences are just as important, you know, um, as the words that do emerge. So all of that white space, um, you know, as a kind of, uh, like a, a heavy silence, something that, you know, a pregnant silence, it's not, it's not nothingness, right? But um, it's like a sort of a silence that from which things are possible, you know, from which things can emerge. So, you know, the idea that there's always, there's always something, you know, adjacent possible there, you know, um, and that things could shift, they, they could be different. So, you know, ultimately the book is trying to, to hold on to that optimism that 
even though you know we seem disconnected we keep trying you know we keep reaching for language we keep reaching for connection anyway you know in spite of knowing that it's a failed proposition from the start um, and i started to think of cycling the the back and forth the dialogue if you cycle quick enough if you go back and forth quick enough between you know two figures two objects two beings it's almost like, <laughs> it's almost like you're connected. Um, and just, you know, wanting to believe in that magic and the possibility of connection. Do we have time for one more question? Oh, I'm, I'm here, sure. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Alexander uh, Ostapenko is asking, what is it that inspired you to use the Japanese forms for this particular book, book length uh, poem? Yeah, um, you know, I think I've always been interested in um, the poetics of presence. I think that's really what it had to do with was just I was finding in, in Japanese forms in a way that I wasn't seeing as available in sort of Anglophone forms. Um, you know, that sort of en plein air awareness and presence of, of what is happening, like the, the primary uh, verb tense in the book is, is present tense. Um, and I felt that the Japanese forms made that more available to me. Um, I also like to play number games. So I, I enjoy syllabics. Um, I liked the tradition, um, you know, of having painterly renditions of things juxtaposed with textual descriptions. And of course there's a long tradition of that um, coming from Japan. And I was composing these poems in, um, uh, you may have seen, I think they're the ones that I'm using were produced in China, but um, they're sort of like the, the pasteboard books that are accordion. So there's these like accordion sketchbooks, right, that sort of fold out and can create this really long landscape. Um, and so I was doing, um, you know, ink, uh, ink brush, landscape drawings, paintings, and, and writing things in those, in those sketchbooks. And so that was, I think it was that, you know, I think it was the material origins um, of the work that, that led me there. And then thinking about, um, you know, but I decided to hybridize them and change them, you know, to kind of acknowledge that I'm, I'm not receiving the tradition unfiltered, right? I mean, I'm still, you know, an American, <laughs> you know, writing these forms. And so what, how does that form change or adapt, you know, um, with that type of writer? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, I think we're uh, concluding here. Uh, and, and thank you, Julie. I, I really hope that uh, maybe next year we're going to be um, having you uh, visiting us in Lehigh. And, you know, like I can already imagine <laughs> the book <laughs> as an exhibit or something like that uh, and well, maybe know. I'll finish those paintings I was supposed right. to do <laughs> thank you uh, uh, or uh, you know like this maybe uh, you know like uh, we, we we can think about composing something even in Lehigh uh, we got we got uh, great composers here too uh but uh to be continued for sure <laughs> and uh and thank you so much and hello shiloh uh i i noticed that you're with us today so uh so nice to see you uh joining uh so um yeah thank you julie uh thank you everybody thank you uh and uh please remember we got more uh stacked for you in the end of the month uh around poetry uh interests uh, so uh, thanks, everybody, and have a good night, and uh, see you all soon. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much.